Hey everyone, welcome back to Fundraising for Startups. And in this module, what I'm gonna walk you through is how to build a financial and growth model for your startup. And some of you probably already have a version of this, or maybe you've had multiple iterations of a version of your financial or growth model that you've been sharing with your team, maybe your early investors. One of the things that I found in working at the angel to seed to series A round is that by the time you get to a second or third meeting with an investor, they're almost universally gonna start asking you a lot of questions on your company growth and specifically how you hit the metrics from a financial and growth perspective, looking at the month as kind of the unit of basis and then looking at the year and then looking at your two to three year plan. And what I found when building this program was that uh, most startups had their kind of own way of putting together this model. And when I started working with the launch accelerator companies, what we did there was one of the first steps we did was standardize the model and even some of the language and nomenclature that you'll see within the model so that there's some consistency on how to think about building the model and then presenting the model to your investors. And while this module is probably less important in terms of getting your foot in the door for a pitch, let's say, it should be the basis of what you build your diligence documents and your data room off of. And it certainly will be the type of material that you're going to get asked a ton of questions in great detail on as you move through the fundraising process. So I'm going to share my screen. And what I'll walk you through is the set of templates that I use when uh, helping companies build their financial model. And this is all part of the Growth University curriculum as well. And if you've been through the Mastering Growth program, I cover this in quite a bit of detail in the first week. And if you haven't been through that program, there's some additional uh, pieces of context that I provide in that program that I'm not going to get really into a lot of detail here. We're just going to kind of get into the weeds right now. Uh, and I just, the goal here is to make sure that you understand how to build these models and that the next module, I'll actually show you how to effectively communicate them. So there's really two aspects of a financial and growth model that you want to talk about. The first section here that I'm going to focus on is your financial model. Now, you probably aren't going to show a sheet like this to an investor, although it's a great backup to have if you start getting asked for your five-year plan, for example. And so the way that I like to think about such an arbitrary uh, thing as a long-term five-year plan, especially when you're just getting started out and you don't have a ton of revenue yet or you don't have a ton of customers yet, is let's look at the model through a few different lenses. And so what I will typically do is build four different mini plans or mini models that show year one through five revenue based on something that I feel about my company. And so are you going to raise a ton of capital and grow really, really quickly, 100 to 200% annual growth? Are you bootstrapping and maybe you're going to be a little bit slower? Uh, do you anticipate kind of seasonality and chunky revenue kicking in uh, or is there something else? And so what you're seeing here in these different scenarios between scenario one, two, three, and four are different ways that I'm going to model out getting to some goal that I have for long-term revenue. And so when I was putting this program together, I had set a goal of trying to get to $10 million in revenue by the end of year five. And so, okay, you basically work backwards from there. So if you're gonna get to $10 million in revenue in year five, what does revenue look like in year one, two, three, and four to lead you down that path to success, which would be that 10 million in revenue? The reason why we do this is that before we get super deep into customer acquisition and marketing budgets and everything else, we have to quantify really what that first year is gonna look like so that we can have an honest conversation with our investors about how much money we need to raise and then what does that fundraising process look like or what does that profit and loss look like every year moving forward so that you can anticipate when you're gonna to need to raise money uh, to spend, for example, on more team members or marketing, et cetera. So I will typically build anywhere from two to four different revenue mapping scenarios here. And, and this is very, very simple. In year one, you, um, you basically put in what 
what do I feel is going to be a realistic and aggressive, but probably not overly aggressive and probably not an overly conservative model for what I think I can do based on what I know about my business right now and the funding I think I'm going to get in year one. What do I think I'm going to do in year one? And you can see I, this ranges anywhere from $650,000 at the high end with this, I'm going to double my revenue every year to as low as um, $100,000. Now, what these charts show down here is the path to that 10 million in revenue. And so you can see that if I can manage to double my revenue every single year, I have this nice graph up and to the right that leads me to over 10 million in year five. Now, let's say that I'm out of the gates a little bit more slowly. I What happens here is in year one, two, so what I'm showing is slower year one and two, 225,000 in revenue in year one uh, actually means that you have to accelerate growth in years three, four, and five to hit that 10 million. So I love to look at this because if you have no revenue or you're doing 5,000 a month in revenue, 225,000 in revenue might seem like a stretch, but you're going to at least need to be thinking about this as you approach that five-year mark to get to the 10 million. And you can already see in these high level numbers that it's going to be a rapid acceleration in revenue growth in those later years. A lot of companies that, that I've encountered and, and a few that I've worked with have had really chunky revenue. And what I mean by that is that you'll have maybe super aggressive growth one year. And then for whatever reason, the next year, the pandemic hits, you've got 50% growth. And then you've got 150, 150, then you've got a couple slower years. And, and that's kind of how more normal startups that maybe don't have a ton of capital to throw at customer acquisition may feel, or perhaps if you're bootstrapping or if you're a service business, uh, or even a marketplace with GMV, um, you'll have some uh, ebbs and flows of that business um, over the course of the different years that you're going to work on it. And so perhaps it takes you seven years to get to that 10 million. Uh, so when I do these again, I, I run it up a bunch of different models to figure out, okay, what do I think directionally year one's going to look like? And so for me, what I'm going to show you is a model that's based on uh, scenario four, Craig's selection, where I think in year one of this business uh, that I'm running, I think I can do a half a million dollars and I get to 10.125 in year five. And um, that means that I have to hit that 500 in, in year one. And I basically have 100% growth every year. I'm basically doubling my growth every single year. Um, I've done this before at other companies and I feel com confident that I can actually pull that off with my startup. So that's just a very, very, very high level snapshot of how you should, one way you should approach thinking about building out that financial model um, this is a little bit fluffy, I realize, because uh, you, you're not really looking at the data, right? This is kind of directionally what you feel, but it gives you a starting point uh, to work from. The next thing that we're going to build is our, uh, our growth model. And I've got two different tabs here. And one shows a transactional business model and the other shows a subscription business model. If you're a service business and you sell retainers, you probably use a subscription model. And if you are a marketplace and you've got a supply and demand side, you likely want to build two of these transactional models, one for each side of your market. And um, that should get you to where you need to go. So what I'm going to walk through here are some of the inputs to the model and uh and kind of what this looks like over time this spreadsheet is what you will likely use to walk your investors through your growth model and your financial model which this kind of encompasses when you have that second or third meeting i recently was talking to a couple of different founders from different companies who are at different stages uh with their investor conversations and they said that that second meeting that third meeting is when they walked through in a lot of detail this model and this has been my experience as well so let's get into it so there's a few things to think about again you're going to take that year one goal that you built in your financial model again this is just supposed to be directionally sound and you're going to start to plug in some of the um, unit economics and things that you know about your company right now so your price per unit what you plug in here is basically in this transactional model how much do you sell your product for. And this assumes that you're just selling it one time to one buyer. Okay, the next element is your monthly growth rate. So your monthly growth rate is basically how much growth do you have month to month? And you'll see this in the model down here when I walk through it. But basically, what investors want to see generally is that you've got two to three months of 10 to 20% month over month growth. 
with some consistency there that will make them feel good about their potential investment in your company. Now, if you're going through an accelerator or you're trying to ramp up to like a series A round or maybe even a, a later stage seed round, many investors that I'm encountering will want to see 20% growth. But I realized that that might be a stretch for a while uh, in the pre-funding state. So what I've modeled in this scenario is a 12.5% monthly growth rate. That means that every single month you have to grow that top line revenue metric by another 12.5%. Now, if you are not monetizing yet, and let's say you're a, a company that has a user base, but you're not yet monetizing, you can substitute out revenue for user growth and just show user growth instead of revenue growth. But it's easier to model um, a growth model based on some of the financials. And 90% of the time, this is something that you're going to need to show even if you're not monetizing yet. So that's why I started here. So you have a 12.5% initial growth rate that you think you're going to hit every single month. You plug in your starting number of purchases. So if you're building this for the first time, what you want to do is um, you basically want to put into this month one what last month's uh, data looked like. So if you sold 18 units uh, last month and you think you can sell 20 this month, then plug that into your model. And then there's some auto calculations here. So your revenue is basically just the number of new subscribers or new purchases at this point times uh, your unit cost. So in our case, this is $199 and it comes up with your revenue. The other thing that you want to plug in here is your customer acquisition cost. So if you think about how you're going to get customers. What I want you to do is think about roughly what do you think it's going to take to get that customer in the door and whatever you come up with $50 or $20, because maybe you've done a little bit of experimentation in Facebook and Google. I would probably double that to build into your model because customer acquisition costs generally only go up and they go up as you scale. Uh, you, when you're starting out in a pre-funding state or if you're in between rounds or you're raising a larger round of capital, what you're likely going to do is bump up against a higher customer acquisition cost because you're going to hit some inefficiencies as you ramp up that marketing spend. So I picked a nice round number here that made sense to me of $100. And so what you do then is you come up with your marketing budget, which is basically just the cost to acquire a customer times the number of customers. So you see $2,000 there. And then let's say you've got a team of three or five people working on this. What I like to do is plug in a headcount cost into my model and then build a scratch profit and loss, which basically shows your, uh, your costs um, and your revenue kind of included in that. And, and you can see that I lose $28,000. So my burn rate this month is $28,000, but I've got $350,000 in the bank. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay for that month. What I do with the, um, with the revenue growth here is I basically have the revenue growth tracking on that 12 and percent month over month over time. And you can see, as I get into uh, column M here, by the end of the year, by the end of this first year, I will be at about 14,450 in monthly revenue with a uh, marketing budget cost of $7,300, a headcount cost of $30,000, my burn rate is 22,000 and my bank balance gets down to 67,000. So if you had 350K in the bank, um, this is the time where you, you really need to start thinking about, well, the fact that in two months now you actually go negative, you run out of money. So your fundraising is likely for the next round is likely gonna start in month seven or eight in this case, assuming it's gonna take you two to three months to close, um, to close the next round. Up here uh, at the top of the sheet, I, what I'm doing here is I'm just summing up the total revenue for that first year, and I'm summing up the total revenue for year two and then year three. And in fact, this um, this spreadsheet goes all the way out to the end of year three. So I'll kind of spare you the details there, but basically I've built it for a three-year plan. And then I sum up my marketing budget, my headcount cost, and then my rough P&L. And so if you're running this business, you basically need to make sure that you're fundraising to the tune of $300,000 in year one, 400 in year two, and, and 667,000 in year three. And in fact, with these unit economics, you never become profitable, right? And so if that's the case, I'm going to start to look at year two and year three and figure out, well, does my customer acquisition cost go down? Do I charge more? For my product am i getting some repeat purchases in here i didn't add anything into this spreadsheet around frequency but that's what you're going to want to do 
In the next module, I'll walk you through how to present this to an investor. But for now, this is how you build it out. These templates are available for you as part of this program. And so I would urge you to download them, kick the tires with it, and then send me what you come up with. And I'm happy to give you some feedback. We're going to switch over to subscriptions. So if you're a subscription business, you basically have all of the same uh, unit economics and, and metrics, except we add in a monthly churn rate and we base a lot of our model off of not just the new subscribers or new purchasers, but the active, the number of active subscribers or purchasers that are still subscribed to you in a month. And so let me walk you through how this works. Again, year one goal is 500,000. And you can see here just out of the gates, even though my subscription is $49 and my CAC is 200, so my CAC is actually twice as high as my transactional model, because my monthly churn is so low, my revenue is quite high and I get to profitability actually in year two. So this is the difference between that transactional and the subscription model. And, and just that high level glimpse is why investors love subscription models because that growth compounds over time. So the way to read this is in month one, you've got your month to month growth rate. And again, this is a 10% monthly growth. I start out with X number of subscribers. So this is whatever I'm starting that month with. Um, I'm so sorry, I, um, I add 100 new subscribers, but I also started with 100 subscribers. So um, by the end of this first month, I've got 100. By the end of the second month, I've got 200 active subscribers, 301, 404, 510. And you can see what's happening is that 10% that growth rate means that in month one, I need to acquire 100 customers, then 110, then 121, 133. By the end of month 12, I need to get 285 new subscribers coming in. And by the end of that year, year one, I'm gonna have 1,428. Now, again, I build out my marketing budget. And again, marketing budget is a factor of how many new subs times how much does it cost me to acquire that subscriber? So $20,000 a month here. Headcount cost, again, is a fixed element for right now. And I burn $35,000. So I have, when I leave this month, hypothetically, I've got 350K in the bank. And you can follow that dip in the bank balance all the way out to month uh, 20, or actually month 19, where I go from pulling money out of the bank every month to adding money to the bank every month. And actually by the end of that year, um, I have put $1,700 into the bank. So again, the, the economics are gonna shift greatly based on things like that monthly uh, growth rate and, and, growth and, and monthly churn. So let me show you what happens here. So watch the numbers in year one and two change. When I change my churn from 10%, which is probably low, especially if you're getting going to 20%, right? So I go from 300, I go from 400 something thousand to 323. I go from uh, 1.7 million down to 1.2 million. And you can see that uh, I don't reach profitability at all in this model because my growth rate is too slow to catch up with new subscribers, right? So that 10% change in monthly churn had a material and significant impact on my PNL, and in fact would change the way that I would think about having to go out and raise money. Okay, so the things that you want to do when you're building these models is um, try to be as realistic as possible with what you think that growth rate and churn and those costs are going to be, and just know that if you kind of pull any of these levers, if you pull the CAC down uh, to say 100, right, but you pull your churn up to 20 you actually are profitable in year two when you look at the PL that way. So just reducing that CAC by 50%, um, even though you increase churn, means that you still get to that profitability in year two. So this is a, uh, a set of scenarios that's gonna be highly, highly dependent to your company, your model, your pricing, and even your view on funding and fundraising and how much access to capital you believe you're going to have and how aggressively you think you're going to grow this company. When I built the original models for Growth University, I had put my monthly growth rate at 20% for pretty much everything uh, that I was modeling out towards, which means that uh, we spend more money on acquisition to get that solid growth rate. But with our churn being relatively low, 
uh, we, we can use funding as a way to basically feed our growth model. And then if our churn reduces or if we get that CAC down, then we reach profitability uh, a lot faster. So I can basically pull those levers as an operator at, on a month to month basis. And this is the type of stuff that you will absolutely look at um, pretty much every month. And so when I'm building my models here, what I'll do is I will build my financial model, which I basically just leave alone. I maybe revisit that once a year or twice a year. My growth models, what I'll do is I'll build a growth model and then I'll report back on it every single month. And every single month, I might need to adjust the model based on what I just learned. And I'll cover that in a future module in this program on how you communicate those changes to the model with your investors and, and with your team. So I hope that was helpful. That is how I look at building those financial and growth models. This takes numerous iterations, and I would urge you to get feedback from somebody outside of your team, maybe a potential investor or an advisor or a friend who's who's run a startup before, reach out to me or any of the team at Growth University, and we're happy to take a look. Uh, but this is stuff that becomes part of that foundation that you're really going to leverage um, really on a daily basis when you think about customer acquisition and everything else. It all starts here. So I appreciate your time. I'll see you in the next module.